Boris Johnson is supposed to be a Conservative Prime Minister. Instead, he's an eco-loon who's hypnotised by woke rubbish into doing the bidding of Extinction Rebellion and Socialism. That's what James Dellingpole and other right-wing commentators think. But are they right? Is action on climate change incompatible with true conservatism? Let's take a look. We know the assumption that's widely out there. The left cares about the environment and follows the science. Conservatives, whether British Tories or American Republicans, trash the environment and deny climate change. If that were true, then you would be somewhat befuddled by the fact that Conservative governments in the UK have been amongst the first in the world to commit to net zero carbon by 2050. You'd still struggle to explain how it was that a Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, first spoke up about the issue on a world stage. And why other European Conservatives and moderate Republicans also line up on the agenda. Now, maybe those people are an aberration from their own political tradition. Everyone's getting seduced by wokeness or something. Certainly there are commentators on the political right who are happy to play to that assumption. For instance, James Dellingpole, who says that Ecoloon Boris will bankrupt Britain by pursuing an uncosted, ill-considered, virtue-signalling disaster in which the British economy will be forced to commit unilateral energy suicide to no purpose while the fossil fuel economies of China, the US, India and Brazil continue to grow and grow. In another article, he makes this statement. This is not why Brexit Britain voted for Boris. In fact, if you had to sum up everything that Brexit Britain loathed about the bossy, nannying, politically correct, interfering, freedom-hating, green-obsessed European Union, all you need to do is look at the Boris administration's list of green policy proposals and weep for the future of the country. Polling of the Brexit voting areas doesn't actually support that contention, but there's a whole other discussion there that could probably fill a video all on its own, so we won't get distracted by it. Dellingpole's view is mirrored by voices in the mainstream media and on the left, who see Conservatives as defenders of market forces to the detriment of all else, because they're blinded by short-term greed and are happy to trash the planet to get it. Most regular viewers of this channel will recognise those as cartoon-like simplifications that don't really make sense. So what's the real story? First of all, it's worth challenging this general principle that history gives us any supporting evidence for the suggestion that Conservatives don't care about the planet and socialism does. In Britain, the environmental movement has its deepest roots in the 19th century reaction to the Industrial Revolution, in which Tories and Radicals were both involved, and the early opposition to industrial farming, which brought together Guild Socialists and Tories like Lady Eve Balfour, author of The Living Soil, in 1943. More to the point, if you look at the history of environmental protection, it has absolutely hinged on property rights. The first pollution case was one established in common law, Rylands v Fletcher in 1865, where a mill owner constructed a reservoir on his land, the water burst through to the mines of the plaintiff. The judge in the case established that common law assumes that the right application is to provide a remedy to the person who is wronged and a penalty to the person who wronged him. That case is still referenced and argued over in court today. Shortly afterwards, the UK government tried to legislate to prevent river pollution, the Rivers Pollution Prevention Acts. They didn't work. Why not? Because the main agency that was polluting the rivers was the same local authority that was responsible for policing the Act. Government has no incentive to police itself, and this is why most of the mechanisms introduced by socialist governments have consistently failed. Take, for example, Poland. During the communist years, it was illegal for the factories and sewers to pollute the rivers. But the factories and the sewers were controlled by the communist state. It wasn't legally possible to bring the communist party to judgment. And let's face it, it would not have been career enhancing or even life preserving to even try. So the rivers were completely dead. Post-communism, with the growth of private property and an independent judiciary, the rivers began to change, with some beginning to get fish returning. 
there's a key principle there which lies at the heart of the conservative principle that hasn't historically been any part of socialism. And that is that you have to have systems that are responsive to negative feedback. Time and again, governments have created perverse incentives and shut down feedback when they take state-led solutions. They've ignored the things that give people incentives for conservation. In his book on how to think seriously about the planet, Roger Scruton gives the example of Ravenna Park in Seattle. Established in 1887 by Mr and Mrs William Beck, who bought land on the outskirts of the city in order to preserve and provide public access to the giant fir trees growing there, 400 feet high. They built a pavilion for concerts and nature lectures, and they charged an entrance fee to the park, visited by around 10,000 people a day. In 1911, the city, in response to conservationist pressure, bought the park under compulsory purchase order. Almost at once, the giant trees began disappearing, cut down and sold by park employees, sometimes with a rubber stamp that condemned a particular tree as a threat to public safety. By 1925, none of the trees remained. This lesson was amplified by the British Forestry Commission, established during a time of national emergency to take control of the forests and the production of timber. Although its purpose was supposed to be maintaining and preserving British woodlands, during the 50s and 60s the rate of destruction of those woodlands was greater than ever before. The lesson from that isn't the simplistic notion that some ascribe to Conservatives, that everything must be privatised. It comes from the destruction of feedback mechanisms and the creation of perverse incentives. And those things go wrong more often in the name of doing the right thing than anything else. Something that today's campaigners would do well to learn. At the heart of this is a misunderstanding of what conservatism has historically been about. Environmentalists confuse rational self-interest, which is what makes markets work, with greed, which is irrational excess. Conservatives themselves have often fed this misperception, as Dellingpole does in that example at the start. They've tended to see modern politics as a simple spectrum between individual freedom and state control. Individual freedom means economic freedom, the freedom to exploit natural resources. A company that depletes a rainforest, a mining corporation that destroys a mountain, all of them are just obeying the laws of the market, and this is elevated as a principle above the destruction of part of our shared heritage. But if the answer to that is socialism, the same businesses carry on with the same destruction, this time in the name of the state, with fewer remedies at hand to stop them. When people get punished for passing back bad news about consequences on the ground, as they do in communist dictatorships, then all feedback mechanisms are removed. The point is that freedom has not traditionally been the only goal of conservative politics. It's also been about tradition, supporting institutions and stewardship. Conservatism, properly understood, has been historically about husbanding resources and ensuring their renewal. Roger Scruton says this, These resources included the social capital embodied in laws, customs and institutions, plus the environment, plus economic capital in law-governed economy. The goal is to pass it on to future generations and meanwhile to maintain and enhance the order of which we are temporary trustees. Arguably, until the era of Thatcher and economic globalisation, Conservatives were clear that we need free enterprise, but we also needed the rule of law that contains it. Thatcherism involved the removal of many of the constraints that kept businesses within the ecosystem of the nation state, so they could chase maximum growth and become truly global entities. And of course, there are a number of different varieties of conservatism. In the US, it's been much more about economic freedoms and rugged individualism, highly prizing the virtues of risk-taking enterprise. European conservatism has been much more favouring tradition, custom and civil society, with a focus on containing enterprise within a lasting social order. The American version comes from a first century of growth of the nation, where land and natural resources were abundant, seemingly limitless, so the pioneer spirit had few consequences of scarcity. Europe is a grouping of states bumping against each other over the course of centuries of conflict with precious habitats at stake. 
Scruton sums it up like this. It is obvious to a Conservative that our reckless pursuit of individual gratification jeopardises the social order as that it jeopardises the planet. It is obvious too that the wisest policies are those that strive to protect and keep in place the customs and institutions that place a break on our appetites, renew the sources of social contentment and forbid us to pass on the costs of what we do to those who did not incur them. But now here's the challenge. That's something that is natural and easy to do at a local level, conserving resources such as water, forests, productive land, clean air, but then you come into an era where we have genuinely global problems, such as climate change or plastic pollution in the oceans, and you get an increase in global actors, such as multinational corporations. So those natural feedback mechanisms of community, tradition, the rule of law, all contain naturally within the nation state. Those become challenged in the face of those changes. And there's a problem we don't often talk about. Social harmony and the environment are not always in sync. Democracies do best at times of economic growth. Economic recession, rapid inflation, impoverishment, these create discontent and political leaders will be thrown out. Hence, economic growth has traditionally won out over environmental protection when the two have come into conflict. There's plenty of evidence that as societies get more affluent, they care more about the environment and it's only those societies that are first emerging from poverty where the trade-offs can be quite severe, as we've seen recently in China and India with some of the most polluted city air in the world. So Conservatives have tended to put their faith in the natural, civilising effects of growing affluence because it works with people following rational self-interest. It works with people the way they are, not the way we'd like them to be. The alternatives put forward by the left-leaning environmentalists, which is to impose artificial limits to growth, such as those implied by global treaties, such as the Kyoto Protocol and arguably the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, is that pursuing the aims they set puts political leaders in the position where they could well be soon out of office. What we're struggling with is a modern version of the tragedy of the commons. On a local level, the solution was the creation of private property in the market. Although critics of capitalism argue that it's all about competition and dog eats dog, in the local marketplace it actually depends on cooperation. It only works because of promise keeping, conflict resolution and the punishment of cheats. The question is whether that's transferable to how nation states deal with each other on areas where they are also in competition. We saw at a key moment in the pandemic how cooperation completely broke down as nations scrabbled to get hold of PPE equipment. So the question becomes, how do you prevent a global tragedy of the commons in relation to the atmosphere or the oceans? Ultimately, that comes down to the challenge to find other forms of feedback than those associated with market forces. This is the question, by the way, that Klaus Schwab tries to answer with his promotion of stakeholder capitalism, that you could build into the mechanism of the corporation for feedback from the various groups affected by its actions. As I said before, I don't think that mechanism works because it doesn't create a system of incentives that makes sense. There's no reason why a business would have an incentive to run along those lines rather than to pretend to run along those lines. And let's talk for a moment about the other institution here, the campaigning NGOs. Since the days of Edmund Burke, conservatism has seen associations as important. Various local groups, trusts, educational establishments, gatherings of people that exist just for the sake of membership, sometimes with a common purpose, sometimes not. So in my village, for example, there's a local charity, a women's institute, a variety club, a local allotments association. There's a group that helps maintain the local walks through the woodlands and so on. These are organisations that exist for the sake of their members and for the locality. Their members are the first to get together to organise around local causes. They don't wait for government to solve problems. They take action when they see there's a need. NGOs are different. They exist purely for the sake of their goals. Such NGOs often offer nothing to their members apart from demands for money. The causes the NGOs champion are not up for debate because they have no forum for discussion. They are unaccountable. They act as uncompromising, single-issue focus in all the places where they get involved. 
Government is about the reconciling of conflicts, finding compromises, and then taking collective responsibility for the many interests in the community. And NGOs attack the foundations of that by refusing compromise, recognising no legitimate interests that aren't aligned with their goals, and avoiding any feedback that might challenge their assumptions. Now, that doesn't mean they never do good work. Particularly in an age of global actors, NGOs can be a counterweight to multinational corporations where they avoid their responsibilities. Because this is where the free enterprise model is at its weakest. Conservatives have avoided dealing with the fact that free enterprise among citizens of a nation state is very different from that carried out by a multinational corporation that has no ties to any community, no loyalties that can't be traded for a slightly cheaper supply chain. So NGOs may be deeply flawed as institutions and they shouldn't be allowed to usurp democracy, but they fill a vacuum. If you don't like them, you have to decide what you prefer to the vacuum. Conservatives have largely failed to answer that. The corporate social responsibility movement arose because a number of business leaders themselves recognised this problem and that it would get resolved one way or another so better they could discover a way that supported private enterprise. It's not clear that that has found a solution yet. Mary Douglas and Aaron Wildavsky suggested four forms of social rationality in what they called cultural theory, which was individualists who look for opportunities and freedoms and who are disposed to hold people responsible for their acts, egalitarians who seek solutions that won't make distinctions between people and who are apt to trust problems to the state, Believers in hierarchy who look around for the responsible authority who will take the matter out of their hands. And fatalists who don't think anything can be worthwhile because forces at work are generally outside of human control. Individualists tend to see nature as benign and human beings as adaptable. Egalitarians see risk-taking as dangerous and liable to push us past a tipping point and so to spell disaster for us all. Now, whether that cultural theory is strong or not, it highlights tendencies that we now talk about in terms of left and right, even though in the real world it's a blend of tendencies, a balance. But the egalitarians see politics as the pursuit of an agenda, a process with an end point. Conservatives see politics as a process of reconciling different interests. It's not aimed at transformation, but stability. Unfortunately, egalitarians have a very coarse denigration of the other side. They see free enterprise and the market in terms of consumerism, selfishness and greed. That coarseness then results in an equal and opposite response, which is where you get some conservatives defending appalling businesses and dismissing global warming as a hoax. Our environmental problems have got nothing much to do with either of those values. Neither of them reveres the earth as something we hold in common that is precious. For that, you have to be able to step outside that coarse level to which the debate has descended. The point of confusion then is what does this mean for these global issues? Because not all problems come at the local level. The worst case scenarios that some of the campaigners paint cut across all that functionally superior localism that conservatives prefer. In the face of an emergency, we behave differently. We have to. We obey orders, follow leaders, centralise. Which is why there's always an incentive for campaigners to play the emergency card. You don't have to believe that the majority don't genuinely believe in the emergency to recognise it as a dynamic in the debate. And likewise, just because it can be manipulated to achieve a political goal doesn't automatically mean it's not true. However, the fact that the literature of climate change calls for political action of a certain type inevitably, this puts us in a situation of at least suspecting that the science has been polluted by political interests. Now, obviously, some people take that to a parody level, inventing global conspiracies of scientists and other nonsense. But there is a real social dynamic in how the language and the research is taken into the reality of politics. Until recently, little of this made an impact. Politicians, NGOs, international bodies, they were all devoted to strategies for slowing down the rate at which greenhouse gases enter the atmosphere. Political exhortation was made, global summits were held, agreements were signed, genuine alarmist campaigning was everywhere, and none of it changed people's incentives, and so emissions continued unabated. Now we're starting to see some more concrete action. So what changed? For one thing, we have a growing number of countries joining in. They've 
arguably been a number of tipping points when it comes to political will in this regard. One is that the growing urgency of the deadline has held up and the steady increase in global temperatures has become harder and harder to ignore. And, you know, this is nation states responding to a feedback mechanism, which is good, which is what's been at the heart of our success as a society to date. It is fraught with difficulty when it happens at a global level because the feedback is interpreted rather than witnessed as it is when it's at a local level. But then, you know, in the same way that NGOs are deeply flawed and yet arguably necessary, you could kind of make the same case here. That, you know, how they respond to signals can go off the rails. Some would argue that's what happened with a pandemic, that you know, they lost track of the, how you manage risk and they over-responded to a problem. Others would dispute that and say, but they didn't over. It is genuinely controversial. But the point is that it is nevertheless a feedback mechanism driven by data that shows that there is a problem to which a response is needed. And at some point, if some of that information, if some of that data turns out to be flawed, you would expect that to also be self-correcting. But also the development by individual companies following their self-interest in the market has arguably reached the stage where alternatives to many of the problematic energy sources are now clearly visible in front of us. Not all the problems have been solved, but then we never advance as a society because we'd solved all the problems. We advance because of our capacity to solve those problems. The cost of renewable energy has fallen massively. The potential for new nuclear technologies emerged. Other aspects such as hydrogen. The prospects of carbon capture now on the horizon. Suddenly we can envisage a future where our energy sources evolve, but the nature of our society does not have to be transformed according to some grand plan or project in order to do it. You can transform our energy sources without creating economic hardship and therefore those politicians losing power. This is what now makes it an attractive vision for them. We don't really need a Paris Agreement. I mean, it has no real enforcement power. But we now have some good incentives to compete on the new technologies. There was no vision for that previously. It seemed too far away for any individual country to have the incentive to make the first move. So what's at the core now of the UK government's plan? It may or may not turn out to be well worked out or costly. Delling Pole's criticism of the plan on those grounds might well be true in which case it might need to be better worked out and costed. Of course, he's one of the ones whose reaction to the left has resulted in a position of refuting the issue altogether. So he doesn't really want it to be better costed. He doesn't think it's worth any money. The focus of the plan is government signals to the private sector to provide central energy sources via zero carbon technology with government money supporting accelerated innovation and infrastructure investment. It doesn't propose major changes to people's lifestyles. Where it sees there may be some evolution there, it would be achieved through market signals like, you know, a frequent flyer tax or something like that. It aims to focus investments in new technologies in local communities where they would most benefit from the creation of those jobs. Will it replicate some of the problems of big programmes that create perverse incentives? Well, it might, particularly when it comes to forestry and agriculture, which are notoriously difficult. But is it the approach most compatible with what we've learned about what works and what doesn't that would actually have the ambition to make change at the scale that we believe is needed? Arguably, yes. Lots of scrutiny is needed. Some real feedback mechanisms and local involvement is needed. The environmental campaigners won't provide any of that because none of it fits their big centralised plan or their assault on democratic institutions. They are the enemy of small incremental steps, believing, without evidence by the way, that radical action with big goals is the only way. Even in this area, where the steps are not that small, they believe it's too little too late, fed by the catastrophism that has defined their movement for decades. But global politics, global institutions, global campaigning has not provided a solution to date. Ultimately, the strongest common factor we see around the world is the most natural motive shared love of a shared space. 
Sterling Polk said that Boris's plan doesn't tie into what motivated the Brexit Britain Conservatives. But that's not necessarily true. Shared love of a shared space, it's a motive in ordinary people. It provides a foundation for a conservative approach to institutions, a conservationist approach to the climate. Roger Scruton said that it is territorial loyalty, like that epitomised by Brexit, that leads them to live at peace with strangers, to honour their dead and make provision for those who will one day replace them. Enabling people to enjoy what they value, to have what they want, pass it on in good order to their children, that is a principle that is compatible with the net zero carbon by 2050 goal. It is demonstrably not compatible with the Extinction Rebellion vision of anti-capitalism, slamming on the brakes, stopping people from eating what they want, flying when they want. Some Conservatives get confused between the two. Because they followed Thatcher into a vision of conservatism that is purely about the untrammeled market as the driver of economic globalisation. And they believe that the only alternative to that is socialism. That's not a form of conservatism that Edmund Burke would recognise. And it's not the form that we need today. 